But coming back to Russia, Putin has a big problem on his hands, the Wagner Group. Russia's fighters turn mutineers. Their chief, Yevgeny Prigozhin, is in Belarus. His loyal fighters are following him. And this is part of the truce deal. Russia allowed Prigozhin to go to Belarus and gave the Wagner mercenaries three choices. Move to Belarus with Prigozhin, join the Russian armed forces, or just walk away from all of it. Looks like a lot of them have chosen their company over their country. Take a look at this. This is a military base in Belarus, just 90 kilometers away from the capital, Minsk. It was vacant until a few days ago, but now new facilities have come up there. The Wagner Group is setting shop to do what, you may ask? Well, no one is sure. But here's what we can tell you. They won't fight in Ukraine anymore. Russia says so. Prigozhin has refused to sign a contract with Russia's defense ministry. In fact, this is what may have triggered the mutiny in the first place. A few days before this attempted mutiny, the Ministry of Defense announced that all formations that perform combat missions must sign a contract with the Ministry of Defense. And everyone began to implement this decision, an absolutely correct decision. Everyone except Mr. Prigozhin. Then he was informed that in this case, Wagner will not take part in the special military operation. That is, no financing, no material resources will be allocated. So Russia says Wagner is out of the Ukraine war. Prigozhin too says they won't fight the war anymore and Ukraine seems to believe it. The head of military intelligence has said, and I'm quoting, the private military company or PMC Wagner will no longer take part in hostilities on the territory of Ukraine and this is the most effective unit of the Russian Federation that knew how to achieve success at any cost. So Kiev too believes that Wagner is out of the picture. But their fighters haven't left the front lines yet. The U.S. confirmed that yesterday. What I would tell you is right now, um, we continue to see some elements of the Wagner Group in Russian-occupied territory in Ukraine. Ukraine says the Wagner forces are still there, but not fighting. They may be preparing to join Prigozhin or the Russian army. Either way, they're out of the war. Now remember, Ukraine says Wagner fighters were the most effective. They were instrumental in Russia's capture of the city of Bakhmut recently. And if you take a closer look, it does make sense. Wagner troops have been operating in foreign lands for years. They're veterans of conflicts in Syria, Libya, and a host of African nations. They're battle-hardened, unlike the conscripts that Russia drafted. So their loss will be felt, unless a new group takes their place. And that group might be the Chechen Ahmed Special Forces. Now, first a quick primer. Chechnya is a Russian territory in the Caucasian region. It is nominally under Russia, but mostly run as a private fiefdom by this man, Ramazan Kadyrov. He's a warlord with his own private army, much like Prigozhin with Wagner. Now, Kadyrov enjoys Putin's patronage, just like the Wagner chief once did. And when Prigozhin marched on Moscow, Kadyrov took action. He sent his Ahmed brigade to Rostov and Moscow. He also vehemently denounced the Wagner chief. Earlier this week, he held a meeting with Vladimir Putin. He posted this selfie to show that he's still in the president's good books. So was this meeting about taking over the Wagner Group's responsibilities? Honestly, it's too soon to say, but there may be an issue here. You see, the Wagner Group was feared for its effectiveness, but the Chechen fighters do not enjoy that reputation. In fact, they're called the TikTok Brigade. They post music videos on TikTok. They have a reputation for being all talk and no work. And not without reason. When the war began last year, these TikTok fighters were on the front lines. They marched towards Kiev in the initial assault, but they reportedly suffered heavy casualties. So their commander, Ramazan Kadyrov, decided to pull them out. And the Ahmad Brigade has been on the sidelines since. Even during the Wagner mutiny, they weren't really useful. Yes, they entered Rostov, but they apparently did not fight, fire a single bullet at the Wagner troops. And they reached Moscow only after the mutiny was aborted. You know what they did then? They released a video claiming that they were on their way to fight. But the Wagner troops had already withdrawn by then. And stunts like these make the Ahmed battalion look like a non-serious force. But they do have one thing in common with the Wagner troops. A reputation for brutality. So far, they've shown it only in Chechnya. They've carried out vicious crackdowns on Kadyrov's opponents. But on the front lines, you need more than brutality. So can these Chechen fighters replace the Wagner group? 
And is that what Moscow has planned? We'll keep you posted. Some things are unavoidable, like taxes after income, or aging in life, or controversies after defense deals. And trust me, the last one is unavoidable too. There could be multiple concerns, sometimes over quality, sometimes over quantity, and always over cost. The latest drone deal between India and the US is one such case. We've told you about this one. India is all set to buy 31 drones from the United States. They're manufactured by General Atomic. They're called the MQ-9B drones. And what's the price tag? Multiple reports mention $3.5 billion. That's $3.5 billion for 31 drones. Now, we did the math. If you go with this figure of $3.5 billion, it comes to around $112 million per drone, or 900 crore rupees per drone. Is that too high? Well, India's opposition party say it is. The Congress party claims the government is overpaying, and that too, around four times more. And such claims have been making the rounds since last week. That's when Prime Minister Modi visited the US. That's also when the deal was announced. Earlier this week, the Defence Ministry issued a clarification. It said the price and other terms are yet to be finalised. In other words, do not jump the gun. Wait for the deal to be actually signed. But yesterday, another report emerged. This one quoted official sources in the Indian government. And what does it say? That India is set to strike a major bargain and the drones could be sold at 27% less than what other countries paid. So we've got three different versions. The opposition says we are overpaying. The government says the price is not decided yet. And unnamed sources say we are getting a bargain. So which one is it? Honestly, we'll have to wait this out. Only an official agreement can answer this question. In the meantime, let me tell you something about defense deals. It's not straightforward at all. There are many factors which decide the final price, like what extra features you want. Are you also getting technology transfer? Is there a local production plan? Think of it like your online food order. The sticker price may be $20, but your checkout price could be much higher. Maybe you added an extra source. Or maybe there's extra delivery fee because you live far away. All of this contributes to the final price. And defense deals are very similar, except multiplied by millions. Take this MQ-9B drone, which India is buying from the US. Official sources say the deal could be struck for $3 billion. If so, then it's $99 million per drone. Now, the UAE has bought the same drone. They purchased 18 drones for $2.9 billion. Do the math. It's $165 million per drone. Australia also has this drone on their wish list. A deal was struck for $980 million. 12 drones for $980 million. That works out to $80 million per drone. The deal fell through, perhaps because of the rate. Then you have Britain. They bought 16 drones at $69 million per aircraft. Do you see the difference in rates? The UAE paid $165 million. Australia was set to pay $80. Britain paid only $69. And this is how defense deals work. Your final cost depends on your requirements. The UK, for example, did not buy sensors or weapons. They just wanted a small radar. But India's package is more extensive. It includes sensors, weapons, and anti-submarine capabilities. So naturally, it will be more expensive. And this applies to all military equipment. Take the Patriot missiles, for example. They're lethal surface-to-air weapons produced by the US. The average cost of a missile is $4 million. Guess how much Saudi Arabia paid for it? 10 million per missile. The Netherlands also bought the same ones. They paid around 12.5 million per missile. Another example is the S-400 missiles. India bought five systems from Russia. We paid around 1 billion per system. Turkey bought the same equipment. They paid $3 billion for two. So 500 million more per missile system. That's what Ankara paid. My point is, Cost differs. If you add sensors or radars or weapons, the product will become more expensive. That's also what happened with the Rafals. On paper, the planes became more expensive, but the package was different too. Could the MQ-9 be a similar case? We say it's best to not jump the gun, wait for the official word, but even then, it's tough to compare rates. These are strategic purchases after all. You can't just list out in newspapers what features you've bought. That's like advertising your strengths to your enemy. The bottom line is this. Comparing such purchases is best left to experts, to auditors, to veterans and arms dealers. 
Because you may think you're comparing apples to apples, but unless you bite into it, you never know. This has been a challenging month for Vladimir Putin. His grip on power has been tested. He faced a mutiny. It's been scotched now, but the damage is still being assessed. So Putin is trying to re-establish his authority and guess where he's drawing inspiration from? India. In India, the Prime Minister, a big friend of Russia, Mr. Modi, he saw a whole concept a few years ago. It was done in India. And you know, the effect is. Реально эффект для индийской экономики ощутимый. Вот э, не грех повторять то, что э, запретено, если и не нами, то нашими друзьями, и хорошо работает. That's right. Vladimir Putin called India a big friend. He hailed the Make in India initiative. And it's not the first time that he's praised India. But in this instance, the timing is significant because A, Prime Minister Modi has just returned from a state visit to the US and B, Putin has just survived a coup attempt. It posed a threat not so much to his presidency, but his military establishment. It highlighted the differences within, the divide over the war in Ukraine and how they should be fighting it. So Putin is now trying to change the narrative to seize control and to establish authority. And that statement about India is an attempt to do that. He's sending a signal both to the citizens of Russia and the world beyond. And what's he trying to say? Well, there are two parts to his message. First, the optics and second, the intent. Putin was speaking at an event yesterday. It's called Strong Ideas for a New Time. Apparently, it's an annual affair. Now, before appearing at this event, he was in a region called Dagestan. He was seen mixing with the locals, taking selfies, even kissing a young girl on the head. It's a sharp contrast from the days of the pandemic when a long table separated Putin and his visitors. Yesterday, he was mixing with large crowds. In fact, in recent days, he has made a flurry of public appearances. At the Moscow event, Putin took to drawing. The Russian president drew a cartoon figure. <laughs> Again, a very rare occurrence. Russian state TV has spread these videos far and wide. And earlier, they, they used to showcase Putin's tough, macho image. Now they're trying to show the world his softer side. The idea is to show that he is a likable leader, that he enjoys mass support. So those were the optics. Now let's tell you about the intent. You see, after the coup, Putin wants to rally the masses behind him, so he's making a new pitch, a new message. And he's taking some inspiration from India. Self-reliance is his new clarion call. Let's, in fact, revisit Putin's statement about India. Make in India had a visible effect on the Indian economy. That's what he said. It is not a sin to adopt what's been invented by others. He chose his words carefully. He's openly saying that he wants to embrace the Make in India concept because it's effective. Putin says there is no sin in adopting an idea introduced by someone else. And Russia needs such a policy now more than ever. They're under multiple sanctions from the West. So far, they've limited the impact of these sanctions and Russia's economy is doing better than expected. But how long can they sustain it? Russia's energy revenues have declined and declined sharply. Last month, they fell by almost 36%. And the result is this. Expenses are high, but revenues are falling. So there's a budget deficit. We're talking about a deficit of $42 billion. And this is in the first four months of the year. Moscow has to fix it. Hence the pitch to make in Russia. This is an endorsement of India's policies, also a nod to the India-Russia ties. It shows how much Putin values this relationship. And this is becoming a bit of a trend. World leaders of all descriptions trying to woo India. Last week, it was the US president who was quoting India. Joe Biden raised a toast to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. A toast to our partnership, to our people, to the possibilities that lie ahead, to two great friends, two great nations, and two great powers. Cheers. According to Biden, India and the US are great friends. Well, the UK, too, wants to be friends with India. Look at this tweet from their Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. 
He shared this last year after meeting with Prime Minister Modi. United by friendship. That's what he said about India. So every country of significance is trying to win India over. That's because it's a major economy. The world's fastest growing. A huge market and talent pool and a geopolitical heavyweight. So while India refuses to confine itself to alliances or blocks, the world is keen to work with India and learn from it. Before I begin the next story, let me ask you a question. What do former US presidents Donald Trump and Bill Clinton have in common? Yes, they've both been impeached. Drowned in corruption probes with lies, cover-ups, pardons and payoffs and oh, adultery. But do you know what else they share in common? Their love for Diet Coke. Yes, the sugar-free, low-calorie soft drink produced by the Coca-Cola company. It saw a heady ascent in the 90s. The world swooned towards the drink's aisles, looking for this fizzy elixir that promised to help its patrons shed a few extra kilos. But today, the soda is struggling. Sales have declined every year since 2006. There's hatred from the nutrition community and dejection from governments. Yet many continue to guzzle one can after the other. But now their hopes seem to have gone completely flat because Diet Coke may be causing cancer. And this is according to the World Health Organization. Its cancer research arm reviewed as partame. It's a white, odorless powder, a low-calorie artificial sweetener. It is added to Diet Coke. It is the very ingredient that makes the soda sugar-free. But for the first time, it is set to be declared a possible cancer risk to humans. A report will be published next month with the WHO labeling the sweetener, quote unquote, possibly carcinogenic to humans. This means there is some evidence linking it to cancer. And this news has already spread like wildfire, prompting widespread angst and collective gasps from Diet Coke lovers but also affirmative nods from those who never believed the soda was healthy. I'm kind of addicted to Diet Coke a bit, and uh, that's going to make me maybe want to think about changing to like flavored sparkling water maybe that's not got any sugar or uh, aspartame in it. I'm surprised it took this long. That was like 40 years or something for them to finally come out with it. You know, but I'm sure they knew it a long time ago. While the news of death by Diet Coke is making waves, I should tell you that this is not the only product that uses aspartame. The sweetener has been widely used since the 1980s. It is on restaurant tables, in our home kitchens, and our fizzy drinks, chewing gums, cereals, and even cough drops. All in all, it's almost everywhere. It has been authorized for use globally by regulators. It has been defended by food and beverage makers. But the WHO report may change all of that. It may force a shift, especially for food companies. Aspartame, it's, it tastes a lot like sugar. Um, and it's also really convenient for uh, front of package labeling to say, hey, this is a, a no added sugar product. It's convenient for, for companies uh, to kind of construct what we call a health halo around some of these products. Um, unfortunately, in this case, as you dig a little deeper, you realize that sometimes uh, something like a diet soda might not quite be the health food that uh, we might have hoped. You know, the consumer taste is a very, very difficult thing to, to get right. So the fact that they already have it right, that's why they're reluctant to change. Um, but they're going to have to. Companies will have to change, but so will consumers. Even though right now many of them are riddled with confusion because this news contradicts what the world has believed so far. It seems like everything causes cancer these days, <laughs> you know, so um, I kind of take it with a grain of salt. I don't think I'm going to give up Diet Coke completely. The thing is, nutrition research is constantly evolving. With new studies, long-held facts are deemed lukewarm assumptions. Really, any time an organization like the World Health Organization changes guidance, uh, it really just causes people to question, OK, like, what what can I trust anymore if, if things are constantly changing? I would encourage People just realize that, hey, this is the way science works sometimes, um, but also as much as possible realize that there is there are consistent eating patterns that have been uh, shown over and over again to be uh, to be risk free. The fact of the matter is a little bit of confusion is better than not knowing if something causes cancer. Remember when cigarettes were sold as something healthy? Maybe this is a case of deja vu with a sweetener, too. And experts say cutting down is the way to go. 
certainly cutting down on it is a great place to start. Uh, it's really incredible once you start uh, removing things from your diet. It can be a little bit of a challenge at first, but um, people's tastes do change. And this change in taste seems necessary. For decades, aspartame has served as a miracle of modern science. It let us have our cake and eat it too. But now maybe it's time to face the bitter truth. It seems like fashion is done being wearable. So now it's just being weird. It's tired of finding fresh grist for its mill. So fashion is elevating fugitive passions to the status of high-end brands. Like making a bag suited for ants. An art collective called Mischief is world famous for its controversial designs and now it has created a bag that's less than 0.03 inches wide. 0.03 inches. Yes, it's a microscopic bag. It's smaller than a grain of salt, barely visible to the human eye, and now it's been sold for more than $60,000. Makes you wonder, what's the point of this? Here's a report. You don't need to be interested in handbags to have heard of the Hermes Birkin or the Chanel flap bag. And now the microscopic bag has got everyone talking. It may have grabbed the world's attention, but are you unable to see it? Well, you aren't alone. No one can, really. At least not without a microscope. That's why it's literally called the microscopic bag. It's an itty-bitty, teeny-tiny work of fashion designed using a 3D printer and modelled after Louis Vuitton's famous tote. It is less than 0.03 inches wide, smaller than a grain of salt, no bigger than a speck of dust. And yet, it has been sold for $63,750. Yes. Over $60,000 for a bag you can't even see. What's next? A million dollars for an invisible dress? Who knows? But the sale of this bag is not too shocking. After all, this isn't the first rodeo for mischief. The New York-based art collective, which is known for such inventive projects. It recently designed the Big Red Boots. They too went viral for looking so cartoonish. The collective also launched sneakers with blood on them. And as amusing as this is, this is not the only brand bringing jarring and unorthodox aesthetics to the fore. Look at this outfit. It's called a t-shirt shirt because it's literally just that. A shirt stitched on top of a t-shirt. Designed by luxury fashion house Balenciaga. Can you guess how much it costs? About $1,300. This brand has a couple of other such innovations. Like tote bag with a built-in glove, costing over $4,000. Blanket bags worth $3,000. And Lay's chip bag clutch worth $1,800. But again, many other brands are playing this odd game. Like Gucci that launched grass-stained pair of jeans worth $1,200. Mosakino's baguette bag costing over $1,000 and its $700 plastic dry-cleaning bag dress. Seriously, what is going on? And are we the only ones confused about this? Clearly not. Because the world seems to be divided over such trends. Now, fashion is art. And it is allowed to be bizarre, bombastic and straight-up uneasy. And to many, owning such items is not a silly investment. They don't view the microscopic bag as a wearable accessory. For starters, it really isn't wearable, unless the buyer is an ant. But patrons of such fashion view the bag as an art piece, a commentary on luxury bags, a showcase of how people will go to extreme ends to own them. And that clearly seems to be the case. After all, someone did pay a bomb for this minuscule artwork, bag, oddity, whatever you may call it. But to most of the world, it really seems like fashion is being desperate with such trends. Being hungry for new ideas and not only that, also aching for the next generation of designers who can captivate the audience and create big, that is not only money-making but also exciting. 
even if it is incredibly tiny. At this point, it seems like fashion has no choice but to take a leap of faith and look uneasily into the future while often suffering a crisis of faith itself. Because after the microscopic bag, it's hard to tell if rule-breaking designers are steering fashion towards the light or pushing it into a trendy, frenzy-filled abyss. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. French riots continue to spread in the third night of unrest. Over a policeman killing a teenager, the rioters hurled fireworks and tried to loot a Nike store as fire raged at a construction site of an Olympic swimming pool. Clashes erupted in India's Manipur state again after two people were shot dead. Virgin Galactic completed its first commercial flight. We told you about it. They took an Italian crew with over 50 miles above the earth. And finally, what makes the 30th of June significant? We're taking you back to the year 1997 when Hong Kong was handed over to China, ending 156 years of British rule. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks for watching.